What's going on everybody? Good afternoon. We're a little bit later than usual on these, but better late than never. And let's face it, PFF grades don't go anywhere, right? You can come back a couple hours later, a couple days later, a couple weeks later, they're still going to be there. So we're going to take a look at these PFF grades. Going to start with the offense here for the Seahawks in week two. Again, this is just the Patriots game, just the one game that we're looking at here. And uh, we're going to try to get a feel for what PFF thinks about the Seahawks right now offensively and see what can be said about them. And again, I want to stress, this is not going to be a video where we go, oh, well, PFF says it, so obviously it has to be the case. We know that's obviously not true, but we are going to take them into the broader picture of our understanding of what's going on with the Seahawks right now. So... Let's go ahead and take a look here, just starting with the overall basic grades. Before we get into the numbers, though, I hope you like this video. If you do, please click the thumbs up button down below. Helps the channel out a lot. Subscribe if you're new and you want daily Seahawks content. Click the bell for notifications. Become a channel member for $2 a month. Those are the best ways to help support the channel. All right, so looking at these offensive grades, I mean, right at the top, you're going to see exactly what you expect, right? Geno Smith is easily the highest graded offensive player, which, I mean, that's uh, that was a slam dunk. That was a no doubt about it right there. If he wasn't number one, that would have been weird with how he played compared to how everyone else played. 83.1. He had a penalty, which may have docked him, by the way, but remember that penalty was the intentional delay of game before the field goal we kicked at the end of the fourth quarter. So... If PFF docked him for that, they probably didn't take into account context, but they probably did because that's how PFF typically does things. So this number could be easily, easily higher. Then you had JSN uh, at number two with 79.7. So that's borderline Pro Bowl caliber play. And then you had Metcalf, the other top receiver in this game, 67.5. Um, he was docked a little bit, presumably because he had the one penalty and because he had the drop. Now, JSN had a drop too, but it is interesting that JSN is graded significantly higher than Metcalf. But both got top five grades for the team. And then you had Charles Cross, who checked in with another really good game, 70.5. Borderline Pro Bowl caliber pass blocking. Run blocking took a little bit of a hit, but nobody on this team really ran blocked all that well. Um, you can actually look at the grades here on the left side, and you can see that a couple players got decent run blocking grades, like Haynes, who barely played. But there's a lot of stuff there that just did not work in this game. And you watched that game, you saw it too. But um, yeah, that's your Fortress of Solitude right there, right? Bobo graded out well, but he didn't play that much, so it doesn't mean that much. Haynes graded out well overall because he got a good run blocking grade, but he barely played. Kenny McIntosh played so little, it doesn't even really matter. You can actually see how quickly the cliff comes, right? You've got six guys with an above average grade, and two of them barely played. And then you have one guy with a barely above average grade who played two snaps. And then it's just like, bleh, right? Anthony Bradford, given that he had two penalties, I think his grade should be a lot lower than this, but you can see it was just kind of bleh. Pass protection grade was okay. Run block grade was okay. He gets docked a little for the penalties. I would have docked him a lot. Chenault, only three snaps, so it doesn't really mean anything. Charbonnet, um, this surprised me. He got dinged heavily for pass blocking. We're going to have to look at that a little bit later in this video, but um, they actually didn't think his running or passing was all that notable one way or the other. He mainly got dinged on the pass protection more than anything else, so interesting. Definitely something worth considering. Connor Williams, bleh. Lakin Tomlinson, bleh. Stone Forsythe, bleh. And I actually thought Stone Forsythe was fine, so this surprises me a little bit. Tyler Lockett, bleh. You, you can kind of see how most of the offense is just stuck in this miasma of mediocrity. We had a couple of standouts. Geno, JSN, Cross, Metcalf, and that's it. And even Metcalf, like, he had problems too. Now, I'm more than happy to live with those problems because he's such a dynamic playmaker. But you can see the issue here, right? You can see the issue with having so many guys just kind of stuck in neutral here at best. And all three tight ends, this is actually kind of a fun oddity here. All three tight ends had bad grades, like sub 50. 
Brady Russell, A.J. Barter, Noah Fant. Noah Fant, lowest graded player on offense. He needs to get it together. And you can see that a lot of this was caused by the bad pass blocking. The only two guys on this team with good pass blocking grades would be Cross and ironically, Kenny McIntosh, but he only had one snap of doing it. And then I guess Bradford as well. I don't know if I buy it, but that's what PFF says. So take it as you will take it. So, yeah, it's it's kind of underwhelming, right? We're looking at this and we're just going, eh, how did we win this game? How did we put up 23 points on the road? These look like the PFF grades of a team that would score like 10 points on the road. But then you look at it and you're like, oh, it's because your quarterback and your top two receivers went off. And that was able to be the tide that lifts all the buoys or whatever. I, I don't know. I'm, I, I don't have a boat. I, I don't know exactly how that works, but I've been told that when the tide rises, all the buoys go up with it. So there you go. But uh, yeah, a lot to work on. Going a little deeper into it, I want to look at the passing chart for Geno Smith here. Kind of interesting and really, really encouraging for me overall because of this right here. You see this in the middle of the screen. 14 passes to the middle of the field. The short middle. 14 passes. Middle of the field. Between the numbers. 14 attempts. And then you had another three between the numbers in the intermediate area of the field. And that, that's not nearly as successful, right? He went one for three on throws between the numbers, mi uh, middle of the field, intermediate. Um, but you can see the attempt to establish using the middle of the field. And it worked very well in the short area of the field, right? And it's not at the expense of being outside the numbers. But, I mean, look at this. He threw it outside left deep five times. And yeah, it didn't work out great. We had the JSN drop out there. We had a couple of incomplete passes, but this was where DK hit the had the big touchdown, the 56-yard touchdown. Um, but then you go over to the right side, you can see that the short right side was his favorite, 8 for 9 for 44 yards. But this is what really gets me going. 12 of 14 for 111 yards in the short middle of the field. This is cooking right here. This is what we didn't see very much of the last couple years. So if you include behind the line of scrimmage, and I don't know if anybody would consider that to be really the middle of the field, but we're talking about 19 passing attempts in between the numbers. And he had six, seven, eight, nine on the left side. And he had 14 on the right side. So he's using the middle of the field more than either outside left or outside right. And he's having great success there too. Like this got me pumped up. Also encouraging would be a little bit more success behind the line of scrimmage. He was six for six on throws behind the line of scrimmage. Only 19 yards, but better than last week. And that's an important part of this offense too. That needs to work. <coughs> and when you throw the ball behind the line of scrimmage, you're not necessarily expecting to go for a big play every time. Maybe not even ever. You're trying to set up the defense so that you can take those shots down the field. And when you see DK Metcalf catch a pass behind the line of scrimmage and get maybe a yard, and it doesn't look like the play had any chance, yeah, it's kind of annoying, but at the same time, it's setting stuff up for shots down the field. It's giving the defense something to think about. So even the fact that he's completing these passes and throwing these passes, even if they're not getting big yardage, is still powerful in its own right. All right, so I just wanted to talk about that passing chart for a couple minutes here. Rushing direction, um, it's not going to be very useful this week. I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and say that because we didn't run the ball well at all. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the numbers here and there's really not much to say. Like when we tried to run the ball um, off the um, left side, there was minimal success. I mean, the thing that stands out here is we never tried to run the ball to the right. There's not a single rushing attempt that is middle right, right guard, right tackle, off tackle, off end. Look at this. You have left end, left tackle, left guard, middle left. What is this? That's the thing that stands out. The absence, not anything we did. It's the things we didn't do. Like last week, we had success a little bit running on the right side. We had success running behind Anthony Bradford and running behind Stone Forsyth. 
And those guys are having issues right now in pass protection overall, so that's what they're out there to do. Maybe Zach Charbonnet can't run to his right, and I just didn't know about that. I don't know. This is this is weird. How do you go a whole game, including overtime, without running a single ball to the right side? This is weird. The most success we had, by the way, was running off left end. So I guess that's a vote in confidence in favor of Charles Cross over there on the left side. And maybe you could say a little bit of the left side tackle is uh, tight end as well, which for this game probably would have been a lot of A.J. Barner. But this is weird, man. I didn't notice, I didn't think it was this bad watching the game. I knew we were running on the left side more. But look at this. We didn't try a single running play to the right side. You would think you want to run the ball behind those guys because that's what they can do right now. I don't know. Figure it out. Somebody explain this to me. But yeah, it's just one of those games where you can't really run the ball at all, not even 50 yards. Um, if you take out the kneel down, it would have been like 47, I guess, which is slightly better. It would have been like two and a half yards of carry. It still sucks. Okay, pass protection real quick. Let's take a look at the number of pressures allowed by the Seahawks in this game. First of all, Charles Cross remains the gold standard. Zero pressures allowed, just like last week. He is killing it right now. Can't take anything away from him. Also, Kenny McIntosh, who got one pass block rep and didn't allow a pressure, so... Hey, he's batting 1,000 right now. Also, to my surprise, Anthony Bradford on 39 opportunities, zero pressures allowed. Those penalties really color things poorly because I came out of this game thinking that Bradford might need to go away for a little bit. But, wow, that's actually really impressive. I'm, uh, I, I, I got to give him some props here. However, I would like to remind people he's a right guard. It's very easy to not give up pressures as a right guard. You're playing one text and zero text. You shouldn't be giving up pressure. And then it gets a little bit ugly. Stone Forsyth, even though I praised him a little bit, and I don't, I still don't think he played all that badly, and I think this number might be a little exaggerated. 50, uh, um, I'm sorry, 47 opportunities, five pressures allowed. That's not good. Maybe it's not surprising because he is a third string right tackle, and I'm still not killing him, but five pressures allowed in a game is rough. It would not surprise me if some of those pressures were kind of empty pressures, but still, this is alarming, and I didn't think it was this bad watching the game. It's funny that he's still one of our four best pass blockers, according to PFF, even though we gave up five pressures. Lakin Tomlinson gave up three pressures, including a sack. By the way, Forsyth allowed a QB hit on top of the four hurries. So Lakin Tomlinson allows a sack and two hurries for three pressures. Um, Not good, not good, and he also had the penalty, so... Tomlinson, there's just a very low ceiling there. Connor Williams, a sack allowed, a hit allowed, a hurry allowed, three pressures. We got to be patient, guys. That's really all I can say about it. I, I'm not going to jump down the guy's throat right now because he just got here a month ago, but he's capable of much better play than this. So just take heart in that. Noah Fant allows a QB pressure. He gets beat up in pass protection, and he only had six opportunities. So we know he's not very good at it, but yeah. A.J. Barner picked up a holding penalty in pass protection, I think, so he's got a very poor grade even though he didn't allow, allow a pressure. Charbonnet allowed a pressure on eight opportunities, discouraging, because he's supposed to be the guy who takes care of that. Christian Haynes only had a couple of opportunities to do it. He had eight uh, reps as a pass protector, and he allowed a pressure, so he's having his own problems too. So still rough, man, still rough. I know it seemed like the pass protection was a little bit better than it was against the Broncos, and overall, I do think that it probably was, but you can still see the problems here. The The saving grace is that Geno's playing really good football, getting the ball out really quickly, and doing a lot of really positive things on that front, so it's saving the big picture a little bit, but there's a lot that needs to get better here for sure. All right, that's my look at PFF grading and scoring on the offense. We're going to do another video in a couple hours with the defense. Let me know what you guys think. Let me know what stands out to you here. I will see you guys later. Go Hawks. Pretty good start to the week overall, but you can see that there is room to grow for this offense.